So, wealth of nations and economic growth here. I may need. So let's look at, run with me for right now that GDP is a measure of well-being, okay? We're going to dig into it and talk more specifically about it. It isn't really, but it is possibly somewhat useful here. So, we have Brad DeLong and Angus Madison, two economic historians, went back and created GDP and converted it into real converted it from nominal values into real values in US dollars. This is in 1990 dollars. We'll also talk about how we do that later on in the semester, right? Basically, it's going to be about inflation. A value of a dollar today is not the same as a value of a dollar 20 years ago. So basically, they did all the calculations so that we're making fair comparisons. And put it in. So what do you think this looks like? I'm going to chart it across time here. So we're going 10,000 BCE. Oh, how are we doing as a species? Uh, not really. Again, compared to what? Compared to, right? Now, also here, one thing we're noticing is per capita. Anybody know what that means? Population. Per, per. unit of population. In other words, this is global GDP divided by the global population, right? So per capita is GDP divided by population? Per capita means head, right? It's the same root as capital. So capital is the head of the country, right? Capita, so it's per head in the country, basically, per person. So and then we get to zero, the year zero, and of course, for Christians, everything completely improves, right? Which will show up here. Let's see. No, All right? And we get a few hundred years later and Muhammad comes and fixes everything, right? Well, at least not on this margin. By the way, the difference between them, they have slightly different methodologies. So the, the gap there, we could talk about that. That's probably not, my point would be that's not as important as the trend here, right? We're still looking at less than $1,000 per person. Okay? Doing a little better, right? Okay, so what do you think the default human condition is? Poor. What's that? Poor. Yeah, the default is poverty. So when I went to Togo and lived in Togo and discovered they were making around $300 per person a year in their GDP, I said, oh my goodness, why are they so poor? But that's not the question. The real question is what happened in the last 200 years, right? So that's one of the first things here. This also was one of the things my students in Iraq, right, were, they were impressed to discover that they're doing very well by the historical standards and compared to many places still around the world. They, right? If they compare themselves to Saudi Arabia or the United States, they're saying this isn't nearly as much fun. But, right, so what we compare things to matters a lot. Now, let's zoom in a little bit because that's a long span of history, 12,000 years, right? So, Up through 1850, right? That's not very long ago. 1850 on, this starts to trend up. We get, right? We get to 1975 and I'm born and of course, then the things all take off, right? Yeah. Right, so if you look at most of this, global growth, Almost all of this growth in economic activity globally has happened since 1950, within living memory, right? My father was born in 1941, so he remembers this, right? He lived through this. I've lived through most of this. Now, so this is really recent. Now, if we split this out by country or region, really, you'll also notice that this is not shared equally either, right? So most of this growth really happened in the Western offshoots. Canada, United States, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, South Africa maybe, right? 
We have Africa here. How have they done? How have Africans done? Compared to what? Compared to the historical record? They're actually they're doing pretty well. Compared to the Western offshoots? Doing terribly, right? That compared to what question matters immensely here. We have Latin America again, right? Asia has started to take off by the year 2000. China, of course, has been a large leader in this. So that's the other thing is that this is not shared equally. Now, if you look in the book, you'll see a chart like this. Perfectly fine. Probably based on pretty much the same data. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this means that the default human condition is poverty, which is a useful thing to remember. There's a reason why economics didn't really start to develop as a discipline until the late 1700s. Because there really wasn't much to study in economics. There wasn't a lot of social coordination. What there was was pretty local. So let's, two big puzzles in economics. One, of course, is differential prosperity across time. What happened in the mid-1800s? What changed? We're not going to spend a lot of time on that one. That, that's really a fruitful discussion for an economic history class, and we'll have some answers here. But now that it started, the real question for us is differential prosperity across space, right? Why are some countries still so poor today and some countries so wealthy? Right. Differential prosperity across time and space. Right. Those are the two big questions of economics. Why do we have so much social coordination in some areas and so little in other areas? Now again, this is going to be assuming that GDP is a reasonable measure of social coordination and we'll have to unpack that. So, here's another one from the book. Here's an interesting question. 80% of the world's population lives in a country with an annual GDP per capita less than the world average. How is that possible? How is it possible for 80% to be below average? That's crazy. The people at the top pulling that. that. Yeah, so this again is the arithmetic mean is the sum of your observations divided by the number. That is one measure of, measure of central tendency. So this is, when we talk about the average here, we're talking about the mean. Is it possible for 80% of the world's population to be below the median? No, because the median is the middle number. We rank things lowest to highest. And so the world median here is China. The mean. Mexico looks to be around the mean, okay? We sometimes think we may not be doing as well as we would like to, right? The stock market hasn't been growing as much, right? Took ahead a significant correction after the cancellation of negotiations over stimulus spending, and right, we may complain about these things, but United States and Americans are pretty high up here. Now again, this isn't saying that wealth is shared equally within the country, right? So wealth is not shared equally across all space, and even within countries it is not. So here, the book also has this, it's a nice graph, basically the, so we have wealth on that axis as measured by GDP, and health as measured by percentage of children, number of children surviving to age five per thousand life births, right? And so you might say, well, I don't know much about this GDP thing. But one of the things is GDP does tend to go with other things that we care about. Again, we're going to zoom in on that here in a bit. Let's see if we can... Are these powered on? I don't think they are. Oops. So let's see here. I have Hans Rosling. Did a number of worked a lot with data. Come on, can we do this? Maybe. Yes. No. 
There we go. See if I can... Visualization is right at the heart of my own work too. Sure. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before. Animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. Not sure how well you can hear, but the key point is going to be so, the data. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy from 25 years He's to 75 axis. years. And down here, an axis for wealth. Income per person. 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So, down here is poor and sick. And up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s, and in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, it's and huge. I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. The United States was in the front, Japan was catching up, Brazil was way behind, Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou, it is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace. It's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you just seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? Would you turn on one of the, the back lights, Cameron? Perfect. All right. So I like that in motion, right? I find that a little easier to get my head around. 
gives me more than just a static picture. But one of the things here is that growth matters. It makes a huge difference. I mean, if any of you traveled outside the developing or relatively wealthy world? No? Yeah? Where have you been, Faisal? Switzerland. Switzerland? Okay. That's, that's part of the wealthy part, right? I've been to Canada. You've been to Canada, Sarah? I went to Egypt for about a week. Okay. To Cairo? I uh, went to Cairo. We went up and down the Nile, so saw poorer parts. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you yeah. will notice fairly quickly that it's a radically different standard of living, right? I mean, that was one of the things when Togo was getting used to hearing kids cry themselves to sleep because they hadn't had enough food. That's, that was what would happen in the evenings. So, growth matters. And one of the things here that's really a little puzzling for people is this idea of compounding growth. You may have heard of this. It turns out small changes in rates of growth make big differences over time. So, any of you familiar with the rule of 70? It's actually technically should be the rule of 72, but 70 is easier to remember. Turns out that 70, so this is something I can, you can obviously have more sophisticated methods to figure out some of these things, but the rule of 70 is a pretty useful thing. It tells us how many years it's going to take something to double. So if you take 70 and divide by the growth rate in percentage terms, it will tell you how many years it would take something to double. So I just filled this in here. Obviously at a zero growth rate, so what was global growth for most of human history? What was the global growth rate up until around 1850? Zero. We were subsistence. Couldn't have dropped much below, right? The standard of living couldn't have dropped much below where it was because then people died. But then somewhere in the early 1800s, in some parts of the world, we started to get something greater than zero. Now, here's the global growth has been roughly, in the United States, how long have we been a country? Ballpark, it, yeah, we're going to, right, 200 years, say 200 years. So how many times better off, so we've maintained roughly a 2 to 3% growth rate in this country for 200 years. That's the average growth rate. Now we have to talk about how we were able to do that, but that's a miracle. So, let's say we started back in 1776. We weren't really a country until, what, 17... We didn't get the Constitution, was it 1784? Something like that. So I'm just starting 100 as our starting point, right? So how many times better off at 3% are we today than we were then? We'll figure this out, it turns out. Because how many doublings, so 3%, oh, we can make it easy. Let's do it 2%, all right? 2%, it's going to take us 35 years to double. You with me? In 200 years, what do we have? 200 divided by, so that would be 2 would be 70, 4 would be 140, plus another. We'll do, yeah, plus another 2, so that would be 6, 6 doublings. Is that ballpark? 6 times 35, it's going to be 180. 210, so that's, that's reasonable, we'll call it 210 years. So, 100 to 200, so we're having six doublings. Are we six times better off? No. We're a lot more than six times better off because there's one doubling, two doublings takes us to 400, another, now it's going to double again to 800, that's three, to 1600, to 4, 3,200, 5, 6,400, 6. So we're 64 times better off. Calculate the percent change here, by the way. We are 64 times better off. What's the, what, that, what's the percent change there, going from 100 
in aggregate, right? So the annual growth rate was around 2%, 2 to 3%. But what was the aggregate growth rate across 210 years? 640%. Nope. Percent change? Anybody know how to do that? 6,400%. Let's look. Percent change, how do we figure out, well, again, change, how do we figure out change? Something minus something. Our new minus our old. How do we figure out x as a percent of y? Anybody know? We take x divided by y times 100, so percent versus change, and now percent change. Percent change is our change as a percentage of our starting point. So it would be our new minus our old divided by our old times 100. So while this is a 2% growth rate per year, what's our aggregate growth across this whole period? Well, we have 6,400 minus 100 divided by 100 times 100, right? So this will cancel 6,300%. So small changes in growth rates can make big changes over long periods of time, right? Going from 1% to 2%, what would we have been? We would only have had three doublings at 1%, right? During this period. So a 1% annual growth rate change makes the difference between 700% growth and 6,300% growth. Obviously, if we could go to 3%, even better. 10%, even better. Do you think you could use this for other things? Yeah, it turns out this is a useful way to think about mortgages and other things, right? Again, there are more sophisticated ways to do it, but this is a pretty useful back of the envelope, quick way to calculate growth rates. Questions on that? 70 divided by the growth rate tells you the number of years to double. You can also, by the way, arithmetically transform that. 70 divided by the number of years it takes to double will give you the growth rate required to get there. Right? That's the nice thing about math. All right. So miracles and disasters. We've already talked about these some. Now, the book calls these disasters. Why is Nigeria a growth disaster? By the way, why does it just start right here? Why doesn't it go further back? Because it's sort of a country? Yeah, it was part of the British Empire before that, and before that there was a, right? So, why is Nigeria a disaster? Yeah, so what are, they, what are we doing? We're implicitly making a compared to what statement here. Compared to the rest of the world, Nigeria has not been doing very well. Compared to the historical norm, they're doing quite well, actually. They, they, they have cell phones. They have the internet. They have modern antibiotics, and right? Now again, some people may not have great access to those things, but their lives have improved. So compared to the historical record, Nigerians are actually a lot better off today than they were in 1950. Again, this is going to be something we are going to take up when we talk about GDP. Why is Argentina a disaster? I mean, it's grown. Trending downward, maybe? Well, yeah, right there. One of the things here is we do have some downward blips occasionally, right? Turns out, if you were to go back to 1900 and pick out the countries that you thought were going to be the powerhouses 100 years later, Argentina was one of the, one of the right, was doing really well. So compared to where we, it could be, that's really sort of the implicit comparison here. The implicit comparison is Argentina compared to where it was back here, right? It would have been one that you would have picked out as being a country that would really take off. Oh, before I forget, why don't we do for homework? Figure out what happened to China. It's in the book. All right, you can look through the chapter in the book on this, right? Figure out why was there that sudden drop in China. Now, 
Why is South Korea a miracle? Why is Japan a miracle? Because they started lower than Argentina and shot up. Yeah. Like to some extent, right? Exceeded expectations. They exceeded, actually, I would say any of these are actually miracles if we compare them to the historical record, right? Now, but yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, these are countries that, that we would not have necessarily thought, right? In 1950, Japan and Korea were, I mean, Japan had ticked up, and then, of course, World War I, no, World War II, right? And Japan was bombed back into the Stone Age, quite literally in some cases, right? And then, what happened? They're one of the, people, one of the countries that took off. So that was a miracle. Now again, miracles and disasters, my contention is that statement requires an implicit compared to what statement, and oftentimes if we can make that statement explicit, that will be helpful. Now, here's something to note. What's going on there? World War II. World War II. So what this is saying is that Americans were much better off during World War II. Does that seem realistic? Yeah. It does? Americans were saying, gee, this is great, my... My son is off dying in Europe, and we have a shortage of cars, and steel is going into these tanks that are all getting blown up and destroyed. This is wonderful, right? And so when the war ended, we had these big, you know, pity parties, right? Is that what happened? No. 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 So something, this, this also gives us a clue that there may be some issues with GDP. It is not a perfect measure of well-being, because according to GDP, World War II was wonderful. It was great for rich mean, people to do all the it, Wasn't it pretty okay for the economy in that aspect? Yeah. Because building of the planes, the tanks, all of that, more people were in jobs, so I can understand why there's a spike. It was okay for the economy as measured by GDP. Yeah. But what do we care about? But GDP? The, I care about human society. flourishing and well-being, and I would argue that Americans as a group, yes, there were some people who benefited if they had contracts for the war, Right? Mm -hmm. But is it, I mean, you talk to anybody who lived through World War, I mean, World War II, they're not like, oh, it was a great time. I mean, now, obviously there were some changes, some women, right, it was good, it, in, at the end of the day, it ended up being good for women's employment prospects because, right, they got a feel, those who wanted to work, it was demonstrated unequivocally to the men that women were capable of doing those jobs, right? But in, on balance, I would argue clearly that World War II was not a good thing. And so this tells us that maybe GDP isn't the perfect measure of well-being. Beware the military-industrial complex. Isn't that where that came from? <laughs> maybe. I think that may have been Vietnam. Oh. So, anybody know what this is? It's a satellite picture of the world at night, right? We send a satellite up and it takes a picture of the world at night. Is that how that works? No. You all understand the world is only half in night, right? So this is a number of them stitched together. I like this because it shows another possible measure of well-being, right? It, which is going to have its own issues here, but is going to be how much light is produced. Typically wealthier areas, we can afford electricity. So we have Japan here, right? India. Africa is quite literally the dark continent here. Now Australia. Is Australia really poor? No, it's not. It's just not very populous. Yeah. Same thing with Canada. So there, again, there are going to be some things that this isn't going to track perfectly either. Europe obviously is very easy to make out there. Now let's zoom in over here. So as I mentioned, we have Japan here, right? Well, let's zoom in. So I, I don't. Is this is this Hokkaido province? Maybe no. Japan's a string of islands here. What's this island here? Anybody know? Is that Okinawa? Is that Thailand? Taiwan? No, basically here, Thailand and Taiwan are down here. Oh. Taiwan, there's Taiwan. This is Shenzhen, by the way, where most of our iPhones and other electronics are made. That's the province there. What's this, what's this island here? Osaka? No, it's not. That island is not an island. That line there is the 39th parallel north, 38th parallel north, my bad. 
which divides oh. North and South Korea. So historically, up through 1940s, this was one country. Oh, it's so dark you can't see it. Yeah, it's so dark it doesn't show up. That southern island is not an island. It's the extension on a peninsula here, right? So this is a useful starting point for us talking about what causes growth. So what did you put down on the quizzes? Just, let's just kind of throw things out. It doesn't have to be things that you necessarily believe, but possible causes for growth. Room for innovation. What's that? Room for innovation. So innovation, okay. Utilization of resources. Okay, maybe something about natural resources. That may not be what you were hinting at, but that's oftentimes what people will say is that countries with natural resources are better off, right? What else? What would be some other contenders? Oh, okay, so maybe we have something, this is good, right? I like the call back to what we've already talked about, right? Now this may not be exact, I think there, you may have been going on a different path, right? So maybe we could talk about having navigable waterways, right? That might be, that might be an option. But yeah, hopefully we, we've been able to diagram what, like, the trade creates value, right? So, yeah, having more trade probably will make you better off. What else? I could just put navigable waterways generally under geography, right? What else do people say? Yeah, Mo? Any other thoughts? Capitalism. Maybe? Oftentimes, there's other ones that people talk about, culture and religion, maybe ethnicity, right? Maybe skin color, there's also some of that. Hopefully, most of you are sensible enough to say that's probably not what's driving this, right? But actually, now we can sort of go down some of these. Maybe some innovation. Is there, is there a big difference between natural resources in North and South Korea, do you think? No, no, there really isn't. No, but like, utilize, like utilizing them. Oh, how well they utilize them. Oh, good, yeah, yeah. That one maybe, right? And then the question would be, what causes different populations to utilize them differently? That would be a good question, right? Cameron? Uh, this kind of off track, but is it, can that, can that unsell the dictator? It, um, yeah, I think so, as far as we know, right? There's dead. been rumors of his death. It's not entirely clear if he's still alive or not. Right? Um, oh, we also maybe that maybe that would lead us to something. Democracy, right? That's another one people think of. I can tell you right now that sadly the research and the data says that no, there is not really any relationship between growth and democracy. Exports and imports, yeah. But again, there would be the question of why are people importing or exporting? Navigable waterways, is there a lot more access to the ocean in South Korea than North Korea? No, not really. Geography, no. Big difference in culture between the North and the South in 1940? Now there is as a result of these changes, but that means that it is probably causal. The direction of causality does not go from culture to economic growth. It could, however, go from economic growth to culture. How about religion? Big differences in religion between North and South Korea in 1940? No. So this does, I mean, again, we could dive in and we could do an entire semester class on growth. It would be an interesting class. I've taught it before. We dig in some more, but for our purposes here, we're going to have a causal model, another causal model. Basically, we have, we're going to have we're going to split these things into ultimate causes and proximate causes. So proximate causes would be things like how well people utilize their resources, etc. But then there's the question of what causes them to utilize them differently. Again, we're using this as a measure of well-being. There's some issues of using it as a measure of well-being, but hold on to those for the time being. So the causal chain is going to run from institutions, which 
We as economists use differently than the rest of, the so rest of society. We have to be special and different. So what we mean by institutions is the rules governing access to and control over resources. Remember that point number four in all of economics in four points? Rules matter. That's what we're talking about here. So for us as economists, MSUB would not be an institution. It would be an organization that has institutions. Institutions over who gets to use classrooms, who gets to use chairs, who gets to check books out of the library. Make sense? Okay. The institutions are going to determine the incentives. This is where we've been, the costs and the benefits that people face, right? The incentives to invest in and use effectively, as Tyler was saying, what we are going to call the factors of production. So institutions determine the incentives to invest in and use effectively the factors of production and how effectively, how widespread we have, or the, the amount of, of the factors coupled with how effectively we use them are going to determine our level of GDP per capita. Fair enough? Big picture framework here. Questions on that? Okay. So let's zoom in on these things. These factors of production. What do you think these are? Those proximate causes, right? Well, we're going to split these out into physical capital, human capital, organization, and technical knowledge. With some abbreviations, I'm going to change the book uses H. I'm going to change this to E. You'll see in a bit. That's because I'm used to the actual original model. It's one of the things I actually did. I went into grad school relatively weak in math because it had been 20 odd years since I'd taken it. So in my macroeconomics course, I sat down and made myself work through all of the models until I could come up with them from scratch. And so human capital enters typically as a multiplier, and we'll talk about why here in a moment. So let's talk about what these pieces are. Physical capital, or K. What do you think that might be? Like the resources. Could be natural resources. It's really the physical stuff that's used in production. It could be the tools, right? So if we think about this classroom, the physical capital would be the table, the projector, the computer, the camera, right? The building. All of the physical stuff that's used in the production. Fair enough? How about human capital? People. Something about people. It actually turns out there's another implicit factor of production that we're not talking about yet, which is labor. So labor would just be the people. We're going to make a distinction between labor and human capital. What might we make as a distinction? Human capital. What's that? Well, that would just be labor, right? We could add more workers. So remember, one of the things we're trying to understand is changes in GDP per capita. And so if we added more labor, would we add more to production? Probably. But what would also happen? We would be spreading that increase in production out over a larger number of people. So just adding labor can't change GDP per capita, right? Yes. Wages, maybe? Wages, maybe. Knowledge, specification? Basically, human capital here is going to be knowledge of how to use the tools. So you could have a lot of tools, and somebody could not have the foggiest idea how to use them. I have an airbrush. I got an airbrush for painting my miniatures mainly just to prime them in the winter. And boy, did I not know how to use that. It clogged up all the time. I would spend more time disassembling it and cleaning it than actually getting it used, right? That airbrush didn't become productive until I figured out how to actually use it. So the human capital is the knowledge of how to use the tools. Organization, you'll notice there's not an abbreviation here. It's because organization is really hard to quantify. In a little bit, we're going to put a formal model together on how these factors of production get turned into output. Not today. But this is not going to be in there because we can't really measure it. Right?
but things like the limited liability corporation, things like the moving assembly line. So the moving assembly line, we had the same, you know, when Henry Ford opened his doors, we had the same amount of human capital, and we had the same amount of physical capital, and production doubled dramatically. Why? Because we organized things in a different fashion. Fair enough? So it's how the production comes to be, like the process of production kind of? Well, I mean, so, yeah, and it's, it's a little bit nebulous. So this is one of those areas we go, as economists, we go, this is really important. And that's kind of most of what we have to say about it. Now, for example, in, in an economics of organizations or industrial organization class, when I teach that, that we dig into exactly why certain companies are structured the way that they are, why they have the incentive structures within them, right? Why are they limited? Why don't, they, why don't we have large conglomerates, right? So that would be kind of, to the extent that we cover this, and we do have some tools to say something about it, it's kind of saying how are these resources organized? Now, you could also view this as largely transaction cost reducing technologies, right? That would be another way of saying organizations. I think I probably, if I was, if I was structuring this rather than the, right, if I was putting a book out and I had already introduced transaction costs like we had in gains from trade, I might say, look, instead of organization, we might talk about transaction cost reducing technologies. It's important. You don't want to forget it, but it's not going to be in our models because it's hard to measure. Technical knowledge. What's this? It's really kind of a scientific, it's ideas. So one way to think about this is, how many of you know how to use a GPS device? I think most of us now do because they're on all of our phones, right? They made it really easy. But back in the day, so anybody know how GPS works? How does GPS work? Uh, well, so you send your location, you have a little, you know, whatever it is. It's, let's say it's my phone, right? Uh -huh. so it sends my location to, um, well, to the satellite. Cool. But I mean, it my doesn't. Phone, my phone doesn't. But like a regular, like a Garmin and stuff. Those ones. Nope. They receive a satellite. Ah, they receive a satellite signal, right? What do they receive, Faisal? Uh, back in the day, I remember we used to have a. It does. And just, like, put it in. Correct. And it, it, what it was then doing was connecting where you were with the map, right? I've still had this. I, there are apps now that when I was traveling internationally, like when I went to Istanbul, I downloaded the maps before I got there. And then I could still, even though I didn't have, right? My phone was still working, even though I didn't have the maps because it was receiving the signal. So what actually happens is it's triangulation. You have GPS satellites up there, and all they are doing is sending out the time, what time it is. They're constantly sending a signal as to what time it is. And it turns out that it takes a while for those broadcasts, the radio broadcasts, to reach Earth. And what, you, what your GPS device is doing is saying, I'm receiving this signal from this satellite, which is a known, a known orbit around the Earth, and I'm receiving this signal from this other satellite, which is in a known orbit from around the Earth, and this one, and I can calculate based on the discrepancies in the time where you are on planet Earth. Make sense? That, the idea that you could do that to triangulate off radio signal delays is technical knowledge. The satellites themselves, the Garmin, the chip that you put in, that, physical capital. The ability to look up based on a GPS coordinates, right? They'll give you GPS coordinates, and, the, and back in the day, you didn't even, what you have was a physical map, and, you, and your device just told you your latitude and longitude. And so the ability to look that up, what would we call that? Human capital, right? And then obviously we had to have corporate structures that eventually permitted us to actually launch the satellites and so forth. Make sense? Questions on those? This is, again, a big picture, kind of somewhat nebulous model. All of these together, we're going to call the factors of production. And yes, there is an implicit factor of labor here. So how much of that we have around, and whether it's used effectively, 
is driven by the incentives. But what provides us with incentives to invest in and use it effectively? Those institutions. So since these are the causal piece here, let's focus in on them. What we really do in most of micro is we just take these institutions as given for the most part. And we look at how those marginal benefits and marginal costs drive people's decision making. But we now in macro can zoom out to talk about what these pieces are. Any ideas? They're all rules. They're all rules governing access to and control over resources. We're going to break these into the following pieces. Property rights, honest government, political stability, dependable legal system, and open markets. Whew. And I'll provide you with an alternative perspective here in a bit. Property rights. Basically, this is who owns what and what can they do with it. Right? These don't have to be private property rights. We can have communal property rights. We can have government own all of the means of production, right? But depending on what those rules are, is going to drive how people choose to invest in, whether they choose to invest in, and how they choose to allocate those resources. How about honest government? What's the story with that? Why would that matter? So to some extent, you can look at property rights as citizens being able to defend their property against other citizens. Maybe we could have great property rights of citizens being able to defend their property against other citizens, but you have government agents coming and taking your stuff. Are you going to be as in interested in investing in those factors of production. No, you're probably going to try and hide them, right? So this is one of the things in, in northern Iraq, they actually have very good property rights. But if I were to go to court, or if my friend Schwan was to go, to go to court against Saad, he would lose, pretty much no matter what. Why? Because Saad is politically connected, right? That's going to change our incentives to invest in and use effectively the factors of production. Political stability. This is not talking about elections, right? A peaceful handover of, a, of power is politically stable. This isn't saying one party rule. You could have, you could have political durability without, or we, you could have one, power, one party stay in power for a long time without political stability. Dependable legal system, your ability to enforce your property rights, and yes, open markets or available ability to trade internationally. That one should be pretty self-evident to us. Okay. And yes, the book, you may want to read through the book. I'm also going to email you another reading for next class, which you can respond to as well as for homework. You can do that and China, I think, right? Now, the question is, do, do these things pass the sniff test? So here would be sort of just an initial sniff test here. Less corrupt countries, more corrupt countries, GDP per capita lower, GDP per capita higher. What do we see? Yes, there are some outliers, right? But there's a pretty clear relationship. The more corrupt you are, the less well off. So that, that says, hey, there is empirical, not just theoretical, underpinnings for these claims here. Now, we can further break this out, right? One way to think about it in the modern era is are the returns to investment greater than the value of current consumption? Again, we could talk about it in a discounted present value setting. If the returns to investment aren't greater than the value of consumption, what's going to happen? Yeah, people are going to consume. There will be no investment in the factors of production. This is where we spent most of human history. Now, what if they are greater? Are we going to get investment? Yes, we will. But in the modern era, the question is, are the domestic returns greater than those returns that are, we can have abroad? If the returns domestically are less than the returns abroad, what's going to happen? We're going to invest in abroad, and we also would get no increase in the factors of production. 
even though we will get an increase in our citizens' well-being. If the returns are greater than the value of consumption and the returns we can get abroad, then we're going to get domestic investment, which will yield an increase in the local stock of the factors of production, which, sleight of hand here, somehow this yields increasing local returns, which then causes this to happen. Down here, this is what we call a poverty trap. Up there is what we call economic growth. Okay?